What if I told you that pure math isn't real? This is an outrageous question to ask, considering that we are in a school. So outrageous, in fact, that in this title, I wrote to my dearest teacher, begging him not to kill me after discrediting his profession. But you know something? Let's step back and think what a pure area of knowledge is and whether math, through that logic, is a pure area of knowledge or not. So, math, any, a, an area, a pure area of knowledge, is an area of knowledge that handles in and of itself and that only cares about its own development, such as a uh, 1930s German artist would qualify a blank canvas as a great piece of art. However, all parts of mathematics have practical applications, and as such, we can say that pure math isn't real. Let me tell you a story. About this time last year, I was sitting down working on this piece of work for school on the exponential complex number. Don't be fooled by the great words. It's simply when you have a number that has a real and an imaginary part, and you elevate it to a series of powers, you get these beautiful spirals. But, you know, I handed it in as a piece of work for a class, and so I didn't care that much about what happened with it next. I just did it for its own sake. But a couple of months later, I was scro scrolling through pictures in my phone, and I saw this image right here of a spiral galaxy, and said, you know what? This looks identical to this piece of work I had done before. What if I could use one to model the other? And here I am, seven or eight months later, developing a mathematical model for the volumes inscribed in spiral galaxies. I know, this is way too sciencey of an example to say that math is everywhere, isn't it? But, you know, it's me, and there's something very different in it, because, well, we don't think where mathematics is. For example, who here hasn't been stuck for a weekend binge watching a series on a live streaming service. I have. I think many of you have too. What if I told you that that little bar in the bottom of your screens that says, because you watched blah, 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 uses this thing called Bayesian tree analysis in probability? It sounds strange, doesn't it? It's a big word, Bayesian tree analysis. However, what is it really? Bayesian tree analysis, analysis is an area of probability where you think of choices of A and B, and you can backtrack choices and estimate what a person will like. And so it's not only how these softwares calculate what we're going to like, because, you know, if you like Stranger Things, I'm sure you're going to like this show about the 80s. But it's also how search engines advertise to us. And it's the way that our modern big data world behaves. And we think, have to think about this because these formulas seem like something very distant. But at the end of the day, they run a great part of our modern technological and binary world. Let me give you another example. And this is going to be fun because we're going to start with a problem. Think of a river with two islands in the middle and with bridges connecting the islands to the river and uh, the islands to themselves, as shown in there. And try to draw a line through all of the bridges without crossing one twice. We could try it this way, or that way, or all of these ways for all, for all we care. It's practically impossible. Well, no, actually, it's really impossible. And the German mathematician in the 18th century called Gauss proved this and with it invented a new area of math called graph theory. Oh, what a grand word, you know, it sounds so detached, so dry, so academic. But guess what? This is simply the study of paths and joints and how you can travel from one place to another. And even more, it's what runs our modern transportation services. And I can assure you, many of you got here using one of these. And I can tell you from my experience, that if, if these didn't exist, 
and people hadn't decided to use graph theory for something, I wouldn't be standing here, but I would be getting out of my car, running here, telling to myself, why on earth did I get out of home so late? For those of you who aren't that technologically minded, I have probably the most ironic example in this whole presentation, mostly because it holds the most deep math in this TED talk. And it's a cup of coffee, you know, it's something we pick up to eat breakfast every single day. However, coffee is modeled by these things right here called differential equations. Don't be fooled by the name. They're simply equations that model change. They're a set of patterns of change. Well, everything in math really is a pattern. And for example, let's say I want a perfect cup of coffee. You know, that cup of coffee that when you drink it, it doesn't burn the hell out of your throat and your tongue. But it's not, not, not also this, this weird meh temperature. It's a perfect cup of coffee. Well, with this, we can find the exact time you need to wait to get that cup of coffee that will get you up and running in the morning. But that's, let's, let's look back even further now in the process of this cup of coffee to the person who actually designed it. To someone who was sitting down in front of a computer with SketchUp or AutoCAD or any of these programs up and thinking, I want to make a cup of coffee. And, so, and how, thus, what is in a cup? What do we need from a cup? We need it to hold the most coffee as possible. Otherwise, why on earth would we make a cup? We also need it to be the cheapest, as, as cheap as possible, and also to be the easiest cup to make. And how do we do this? It is done through this application of integral calculus called a solid of revolution, which is when, which is when you take a function such as this and then turn it around to create these beautiful three-dimensional shapes such as the vase you have behind of you. And from that, we can find the exact volume of the cup. But not only that, the exact amount of clay you need and the processes you need for a machine to create this cup. But let's stop for a second. What am I really telling you? Why am I giving you all of these detached examples about how math is used in our real lives? To remind you of a little thing, and it's that math is the study of patterns. It underlies absolutely everything, from the way that particles are compressed and rarefracted and they come into your ears as sound, to the way the chairs you're sitting on work, or the way this sign is held up. It's absolutely everywhere, and it's not only in that, it's in a piece of music. It's in the way we play a sport. It is almost the fabric of how we handle life. And so this raises the question, do we have to change how we see mathematicians? Shouldn't we see them as creatives? Because, you know, we have this image of the old professor stuck in a dusty lecture room full of chalk, working on their theories because they love them, but without a single clue about what they are really worth. But I think different. I think that a mathematician is someone like Saha, the person you have over there, Saha Hadid, one of the greatest architects of the early 21st century. What did she do? She took topology, which is arguably one of the most theoretical and entrenched areas of math, which is only used really for working with quaternions and special re general relativity in physics. But you know, she was able to take this dry topic and use it to create beautiful works of art. Not only that, to create beautiful works of art in which we can live and also that foster a better way of life. And so, this draws us to the thought that this picture of good old Dalby over here is kind of outdated. It's 80 years old by now. We should go back here to the blank slate because mathematics is a tool not only for analysis or for interpretation, but also 
for creativity and for design. And as such, it is a tool we can use for everything, leaving us three big conclusions. The first one, that pure math isn't real because all of it is apply, even though my teacher is not gonna like that. The second one, that the, our image of what, what a mathematician is is fundamentally wrong and it needs to be developed and changed. And third one, and probably think for this for a second because it's probably the most important thing in this talk. That time in sixth or seventh grade when we were sitting down, looking at a teacher, scribble down formulas and plug in numbers and we asked ourselves, what on earth is this gonna do to help my life? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but you and I were all wrong. My name is Paulo Sandquist, and thank you.